Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, I'm uh, wearing uh, all green today as I will be presenting uh, a topic related to uh, green uh, technology. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is uh, grant improvement, uh, sustainable technology for uh, infrastructure construction. The outline for my presentation today is as below. There will be four key points that I would like to cover. One is the global warming and uh, construction. This is just a background. And then we will go into what is uh, ground improvement. And subsequently, I go through uh, some application of uh, ground uh, improvement. Uh, fi finally, I will show a project a case study on uh, carbon uh, footprint reduction by using um, this uh, ground improvement uh, technology. Now, uh, let's uh, move on to uh, the topic uh, global warming and construction. Um, 15 years ago, you see, uh, I was attending our company conference in, in 2006. And that is when uh, the issue of global warming first caught my attention. Um, and because this video, the an inconvenient truth was uh, handed out during the uh, conference. Uh, today, uh, 15 years later, I think uh, many would have uh, been uh, very familiar with the issue of global warming, uh, the causes and its um, impact. So this is a very interesting uh, animation by Professor Ed Hawking from University of Reading. This uh, animation actually shows uh, the global temperature change from uh, 1850 to 2020. Uh, the pace of the chain is uh, immediately obvious, uh, especially over the past few decades. You can see the global warming is happening uh, much faster in the past few decades. In fact, uh, five warmest years on record has all occurred since 2015. And if you look at the animation, there's two circle. One is 1.5 degrees Celsius and another one is a two degree Celsius. The two degrees Celsius is the long-term uh, target set by Paris Agreement in 2015, where a 200 country, about 200 country, agree to limit the global warming to well below two degree, uh, preferably 1.5 degree compared to the pre-industrial level. So we can see that uh, uh, why is 1.5 degrees Celsius? Because uh, climate scientists have concluded that by 2040. Uh, if we want to avoid the most devastating uh, effect of global warming, the, uh, such as extreme drought, wildfire, flood, tropical storm, and other disaster uh, due to climate change, uh, we must limit the global warming to uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. And uh, what causes the global warming? I think many know that it's due to mainly due to the uh, release of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, and other air pollutant, which we call the greenhouse gases that uh, trap the um, uh, sunlight and solar radiation that's bound off uh, the Earth's surface. And uh, because of this, uh, the planet become hotter. And to measure the effect of uh, this uh, amount of CO2, uh, the term carbon footprint are mainly used. So uh, this carbon footprint is uh, direct or indirect carbon emission. Uh, along with other greenhouse gases released to the environment, which is uh, related to climate change and is a result of human uh, production and uh, consumption activities. It is uh, expressed as weight of CO2 emission uh, produced in time and can be calculated for individual and organization, uh, an entire nation, and also for projects, as you will see later uh, from the presentation, uh, uh, the CO2 calculated for one of the projects we completed. Yeah. And uh, this uh, slide actually shows uh, the global share of building and construction final energy and emission uh, for year 2019. It's published by United National United Nation Environment Program uh, in a report uh, year 2020 uh, based on the data by International Energy Agency IEA. Uh, you will see that uh, from the this, um, diagram that about 35% of the uh, energy consumption, uh, global energy consumption was, was from building uh, activities, meaning that it's from building construction and op operation. Of course, the construction is actually 5% here in terms of the uh, consumption. In terms of 
emission, the building uh, construction activity actually produce 10% uh, um, of the global CO2 emission. And uh, in fact, uh, this uh, building and, uh, and operation and construction uh, is the uh, most uh, highly emission, uh, which count to 38% of the uh, global uh, CO2 emission. Now, uh, today we would like to talk about ground improvement as a sustainable uh, green energy, uh, sorry, green technology. So why uh, ground improvement is a sustainable solution? Um, you will see that many of the ground improvement techniques uh, contain no cement, concrete or steel, uh, with some technique uh, using a very minimal cement or aggregate. As such, uh, the carbon footprint from foundation build using a uh, ground improvement technique is definitely much lesser than uh, those of uh, deep foundation, for instance, a piling scheme. And uh, in many instances, uh, well-designed ground improvement solution can provide the most cost-effective and environmental friendly foundation solution when dealing with poor ground. Uh, you will see later that uh, ground improvement uh, is a green technology that can provide project owners with the opportunity to reduce uh, energy consumption, lower CO2 emission and uh, decrease in uh, material usage. And more often than not, as a bonus, uh, it might also help to save costs and time uh, for a project. After all, uh, nobody will go for new technology like ground improvement technology if it is more expensive normally from the Asian uh, context at least. Now, uh, let, us, let us move on to uh, what is uh, ground uh, improvement. So uh, when we build on soft ground, uh, there are some consequences. So you might have a bearing capacity and stability issue. Uh, you might also have a liquefaction risk under dynamic load. And uh, another major issue is uh, absolute and uh, differential settlement. So all of this uh, will need to be uh, catered on uh, to be within an acceptable uh, limit. So this problem uh, can be solved by using uh, the following uh, solution. Um, one of it is if the soil is bad, we find a better ground to build, we build elsewhere, uh, but it may not be always practical. Another one is we can uh, dig out and uh, replace, meaning that dig out the bad soil and replace with a uh, good soil and do our construction. Uh, more often than not, uh, deep foundation, you know, is the solution that is being used, uh, which is using a piling system. And, uh, of course, there's also option for us to reinforce the structure, for example, using a thicker uh, ground slab or what sort ever to, to, to uh, withstand the uh, future settlement. And today we are going to talk about ground improvement as an, another alternative to solve the building on soft soil uh, problem. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is normally considered when the uh, technical requirements are met and the cost is competitive. Uh, as, as mentioned, uh, nobody is willing to pay more uh, for, for a solution normally. Um, what is ground improvement? Um, basically, it's an in-situ geotechnical construction process aimed at improving the engineering performance of the foundation soils. And then uh, the aim is to bring about the condition where the soil is improved to be good enough uh, to be a cost-effective solution on a uh, foundation problem. So, for instance, you will see that this uh, picture here. This is a dynamic compaction for a university where the loose uh, sandy material uh, was uh, compacted uh, to become dense so that the uh, ground can be used to support the building of a university. And below here is a vacuum consolidation for a power plant in Vietnam where the soil is uh, consolidated using vacuum system uh, to omit the use of piles you know, for majority of the structure built on this uh, treated ground will be on a shallow foundation. Uh, there is two distinct group of ground improvement. The first one is the ground improvement technique where the densification uh, is, is done on the structure where you don't add in material to the structure. So you will densify the soil by either using uh, compaction or you can also using a consolidation to uh, densify the soil sort of. And the soil is, is the same soil, but with an improved uh, property. 
Another method is the ground reinforcement techniques where you are actually putting in uh, inclusion into the soil. So by putting this inclusion, uh, uh, this inclusion are normally a better property uh, material. For example, it could be uh, um, cement mixing, it could be grout, uh, even concrete. Sometimes it can be also uh, stone. Uh, by putting in this inclusion, you are creating a composite. So you are creating a sort of a like new soil with a better property. And these are the type of uh, ground improvement technique that can be adopted and it can be used for different type of uh, soil. So you can see from peat, uh, clay and silt, normally you will use consolidation methods. Uh, you will use uh, either a normal vert vertical drain with surcharge and, and or vacuum consolidation. Uh, for earthquake, you can use drainage method by putting in earthquake drain. And for uh, granular material like sand and gravel, you can go in with the densification methods by doing convection, either using dynamic convection, fibro convection, uh, rapid impact convection. And the bottom part is where you add in material. Uh, the dynamic replacement pillars and stone column, you're actually putting in uh, granular material to form column into the soil. And the other control modules, columns, soil mixing, and jet grouting, that is where you are actually putting in a hydraulic binder uh, to form a column. So the upper one is really green because you don't really add in uh, a, an additional material to the soil. You just change the property of the material, the, the soil. Uh, but the bottom one, yes, it is where you put in additional material, like granular material or, or binder. Uh, but still, uh, as mentioned earlier, the quantity is minimal as compared to a more structural solution like PALS. Uh, this is just to give an overview uh, of the methods that offered by MENA. There's in total about 14 uh, ground improvement methods that we are offering uh, globally. Uh, I won't go into the details. Um, and uh, the next question is, how can we choose the right uh, ground improvement uh, techniques? So. Uh, these are some of the factors that need to be considered. So you need to consider what is the ground condition, what is the load intensity, what kind of uh, budget you have. Of course, uh, if you have limited budget, maybe you need to use a technology that taking a bit longer time. So there's a project schedule that you need to consider. And of course, uh, what kind of technical specification, uh, what, what are the settlement you are okay to allow for your structures uh, and what kind of bearing capacity you wanted to achieve. And the other thing is also this uh, ground improvement techniques, some have the limitation on the treatment that it can achieve. So these are also uh, factors that need to be uh, considered. Uh, where have these uh, ground improvement uh, techniques uh, being applied? Uh, you see that uh, it can be applied for most uh, industry. In fact, uh, we have done a lot of projects for uh, roads and rail railways. So you can do it for road embankment, railway embankment, uh, bridge approach, crossing, and things like that. Uh, we have also used a lot of this type of technology for buildings. For instance, uh, residential buildings, low rise one, we use for logistic um, uh, warehouse facilities, uh, things like that. And of course, a lot of ports and airports was also built uh, on ground improvement. Uh, it can be uh, airport, uh, runway, uh, parking aprons, uh, you will see later with some uh, case study that we're going to show. And uh, of course, uh, the um, seaport also, uh, container terminal and things like that. And then uh, for industrial and energy sectors, uh, recently uh, we have also embarked in South Asia some project on, for example, uh, wind uh, farm, wind turbine, you will see later. We have used it for um, power generation plant we have also used it for, let's say, sewage treatment plant, water treatment plants, and, and uh, things like that. So it's a very versatile technique where we can use for almost all sort of uh, construction uh, projects, provided the, the uh, criteria are met. Of course, I'm not saying that the ground movement can be used for all, all uh, projects, but yes, uh, it has been used for a lot of uh, projects, in fact. Now, I will bring you to the real project where this uh, ground improvement uh, technology have been uh, applied. So um, first uh, and foremost, before I go into the 
uh, case studies. Uh, I, I would like to introduce where my nut is located because the case study that I was going to show is based on the project uh, we did on, on this country. So our uh, office, the first office in South Asia or, or the regional office in South Asia is in Malaysia. And subsequently, we have another office uh, in uh, Indonesia, specifically in Jakarta. And uh, after that, we open our office in Vietnam. And uh, there's an office in Singapore. We have it very early. We close it down, and we now we open it back again uh, in Singapore. And uh, about two years plus ago, we start to have an office in, in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, finally, this year, we started a new office in uh, Cambodia. So uh, I, I believe uh, with, with times you will see more colors uh, on, on this map, let's say Philippines or Thailand or, or Myanmar, we, we, we are in uh, expansion mode uh, as uh, ground improvement uh, actually uh, getting quite a lot of reception, receptive by the uh, industry actually. Now, uh, let's move to um, Cambodia. This is uh, actually the uh, project that we completed in uh, Cambodia uh, last year. This is for the construction of the um, first treatment line of a water treatment plant, uh, where this uh, ground uh, improvement using uh, prefabricated vertical drains. So we, you see that this is the equipment that we put in the drain in. Um, you see, uh, with using this vertical drain, we can accelerate the uh, consolidation of the soil. Uh, with that, uh, we can uh, omit the use of uh, deep uh, foundation uh, and we can make sure that most of the settlement uh, due to the loading that we put on the ground happen uh, during the construction. So it's a very cheap method, but uh, very effective if designed and construct uh, properly. Uh, the second project that I will bring you is uh, in uh, Vietnam, where we have uh, completed a power plant using a vacuum consolidation. Uh, this is quite an old project, but it's a, a very meaningful project in the sense that uh, this is uh, among the few uh, first uh, ground improvement project using vacuum consolidation. Uh, the idea of using vacuum consolidation is that just now you will see there's a vertical drain that we put in, but by using a vacuum, we are actually putting in uh, using a vacuum pump to create atmospheric pressure to uh, consolidate the soil. So using this, we can actually reduce uh, the um, sand filling uh, that is required or earth filling uh, that's required to such as the, the ground. And in, in this case, we, we can reduce up to four meter less of temporary backfill. And for this project, actually we we can complete the project, uh, the construction of the power plant uh, by su suppressing most of the piles, except for the location where the load is uh, very uh, intense, very high loading. So we have no choice, we still go with the power, but for most of the area, it was uh, on a shallow foundation. Uh, this is a very old project uh, we completed in Singapore many years back. Uh, in fact, this is for the expansion of the uh, Pasir Panjang Container Terminal, which, which is going to be closed not too long from now. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting project because we combine two compaction methods on a reclaimed land. You will see that uh, we're combining the uh, dynamic compaction methods and the vibro compaction methods to compact the um, reclaimed land. Uh, the idea is that we use vibro compaction to compact the lower part of the uh, reclaimed land, the sand, and we use dynamic compaction to compact the surface part of, of it. So with this, we actually are able to accelerate the uh, compaction process for this um, uh, container terminal. And uh, moving on down south to uh, Jakarta, this is a, a project using a control modulus uh, column uh, for the terminal, uh, for the parking uh, apron extension uh, for terminal three of this uh, Jakarta International Airport. Airport. So you will see that uh, this project is, is very challenging because of the uh, very limited working time and at times and also the airport environment, you know, in terms of security and things like that. So uh, control modulus column uh, is adopted because it, it has a very minimal impact to the environment. So by using uh, these methods, uh, there is no vibration, uh, it's very low noise and uh, there is minimal spoils when this uh, inclusion is put into the ground, as you can see that the platform here is 
quite clean even after we install the um, column inside. And uh, most of all, it's, it's a technique that is very fast uh, compared to, let's say, even to uh, piling methods in, in this uh, scenario. And uh, more recently, uh, in fact, it was last month, we, we have uh, completed the construction of uh, 12 uh, wind turbine generator. So this is one of the example where uh, control modulus column uh, was used uh, to uh, as the foundation system for this um, uh, wind turbine genera generator. Um, again, it was used because of the minimal impact to the environment and for this project also because of uh, its uh, speed of construction. You see, we kept able to manage to uh, complete 12 uh, turbine uh, in a period of about two months only. Uh, last stop, uh, I will bring you to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, this is a project that we completed quite recently also uh, earlier this year. Uh, this is the construction for a water intake facility and a water treatment plant uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, it is a very interesting project where the deep soil mixing methods has been used uh, to solve the problem uh, of bearing capacity and uh, allowable settlement. Uh, but more interesting, is also that uh, the deep soil mixing has been uh, designed uh, to cater for the uplift pressure also. So um, it's not many jobs where uh, this technology has been used to uh, cater for uplift uh, method. So you will see that uh, ground improvement have been used uh, for many, many uh, structures. Uh, up to now, you may be asking me, uh, I have not been talking about uh, carbon uh, <laughs> reduction at all. So, um, uh, saving the, the best for last, in fact, I have not shown you any project from Malaysia. So, uh, I bring you to uh, Malaysia. This is a project in uh, Putrajaya, Malaysia, which is the uh, federal administrative capital of uh, Malaysia. Uh, to this case study, you will see how ground improvement technology can be uh, adapted uh, to reduce the carbon footprint as compared to the uh, conventional construction methods. So this is uh, for the construction of uh, embankment uh, ranging from uh, 5 meter height to uh, 16 meter high. So 16 meter is really a very high embankment. And uh, this is just to show you where's the location. This yellow dotted line uh, circle here show you where's the um, interchange is. Uh, nearby it is the Prajaya Convention Center. And not too far from it, uh, this is where the um, sort of like the heart of this uh, Prajaya uh, is, where this is the PM office. And, and this is the big mosque that I showed just now. Uh, just quickly to go through the soil property, you will see that the soil is uh, soft, silty clay um, up to five to six meters with some peat. So it's a very soft uh, soil. And uh, the groundwater table is pretty high. You can see that water is almost at, at the surface. So it's, it's really a very bad ground. Actually, uh, you will see that the, the black thing is, is sort of like the uh, organic material peat kind of thing. Uh, the initial proposal is uh, removal and replacement. So the idea is to excavate out five to six meter and replace it with a good material, uh, compacted material. So the issue for this project is that uh, the disposal problem and uh, the cost of uh, importing suitable material. So because this is in the federal administrative capital, it is quite hard to dispose uh, the material. Um, probably the nearest dump pit will be about 20 to 30 kilometers away. And the other challenge is to uh, do a deep excavation, more than uh, five meters, uh, into a ground where the groundwater table is high. So you would have difficulty of, of uh, excavating, excavating down because you might be sort of like excavating a, a big swimming pool, you see. So because of that, uh, we have come in to propose a, a ground improvement. Uh, in this case, we are proposing a dynamic replacement column with a PVD. With that, we are able to uh, reduce the imported material by uh, 70 to 80 uh, percent because you will see later by using uh, ground improvement, we are not replacing 100 percent of the soil, but we are sort of like replacing uh, 20 to 30 percent of the soil with a better uh, uh, quality material by forming a flush column onto the ground. 
of course, the challenge for this project is that we need to complete the whole project within uh, 12 months, including the uh, embankment construction and consolidation, uh, but not including the pavement work itself. Um, of course, uh, another challenge is that because the embankment is up to 16 meter high, the um, maintaining the stability of high embankment during construction is also a big issue actually. Um, the methods, as I mentioned, uh, we are constructing the method uh, using uh, dynamic replacement, what we did is that we put a layer of sand on top and we use this heavy pounder here, uh, compacting to the soil. And by compacting the soil inward, we are displacing the soil sideways uh, along the uh, at the same time forming a, a column. So you would get a very big uh, diameter column of about 2.2 to 3 meter probably. Uh, kind of column on, onto the ground. Uh, at the same time, also to accelerate the consolidation, we are putting in a vertical drain uh, in between uh, the column also. So this is to show you how the column look like after it's being excavated. And this is how the hole is created by using this uh, big powder. This powder size is about uh, 1.8 to 2 meter in, in terms of diameter. Uh, and this is the exposed uh, column. So, uh, as you can see, we, we do quite a lot of using quite a lot of granular fuel for, for this. And for this project, actually, we are able to use some of the construction debris as our fuel material also. Uh, so we are sort of like recycling uh, some of the use of uh, material. Uh, this is just to give you an idea how the design is being done. So here in section A, uh, because this is under the slope, we are putting in the closer spacing at 4.5 meters. Uh, spacing with the column diameter of 2.5. The replacement ratio is about 24% here. In the middle, it's just going to take on the bearing. We are using a wider spacing of uh, 5 meter by 5 meter. And the uh, replacement ratio is about 16%. Uh, so all in all, we are actually doing a replace, replacement of about 20% 20 I would say. Uh, this is the result of the uh, settlement uh, monitoring that we gave, uh, we get from the site. Uh, we see that uh, the settlement plate was installed at every 15 meter distance, and uh, the average settlement is about 45 uh, centimeter after ground treatment. And we have calculated that if we don't uh, use dynamic uh, replacement column, if we just use a normal uh, embankment construction without uh, the R column, it will settle 70 to 110 centimeter. So dynamic replacement column are able to reduce the total settlement by about 50%, you see. So by, by putting in uh, this uh, column into the ground uh, at 20% replacement ratio or so, we are able to reduce the total settlement by about 50%. So it, it is uh, very effective in that sense. Um, so for this project, we commenced uh, the pre-engineering work in October 2001, and we are able to finish the embankment construction at November 2002. So, okay, yes, about one year or 13 months in, in completing the projects. Uh, now, we went on to the, uh, we go on to the more interesting part on the carbon footprint uh, calculation. You will see that the, um, uh, the original solution where removal and replacement is used, there will be about 55, sorry, 550,000 cubic meter of unsuitable material to be excavated and removed. And we need to be finding a dump site for it to be done. And then uh, we need to transport in about 650,000 uh, cubic meter of uh, fuel material to replace this um, bad material that we excavate up. And of course, we need to compact this uh, 550,000 cubic meter uh, back into the ground. And along the process of construction, we need to continuously do the dewatering process because the excavation is up to five meters below the ground uh, and the groundwater table is high. So uh, in terms of uh, solution with dynamic uh, replacement and vertical drain, uh, we are using a one uh, dynamic replacement rig, one PVD rig, and one shower to, to do the work. And um, we need about 147 uh, cubic meter of backfill material for the arc column, uh, including some construction debris, as I mentioned earlier. And a vertical drain of uh, 6.5 meter length at 1.35 meter square grid 
And for this project, we, we do not need to put any surcharge fee. Uh, and uh, we are inducing a settlement in average the whole area about uh, 35 cm. So this is what the uh, total carbon footprint, so meaning a kg of carbon CO2 that we calculated for per square meter of treatment area. So by using the conventional methods, removal and replacement, because of a, a lot of hauling and, and uh, moving of uh, earth fuel and whatnot, the uh, total CO2 per meter square of treatment area will be about 37.4. CO2, uh, kg of CO2 per meter square of treatment area, uh, whereby by using uh, these uh, ground improvement methods, uh, using dynamic replacement and vertical drain, the carbon footprint is, is mainly from the fuel of the uh, running the machine. And of course, the uh, fuel uh, for the DR column, the 147,000 cubic meter. So you see the still majority is from the fuel material. So because these are mainly earthwork, the fuel material is even much more. That's why the CO2 uh, release is, is much higher. So in short, uh, for this project, we are able to save about 32 kg of CO2 by using ground improvement uh, technology. And for the entire treatment area of 102,000 uh, square meter, we are able to save uh, 3,264 tons of uh, CO2. So what, what does that mean, 3,264 tons? Uh, maybe we, we would not have any feeling. But if I uh, put it into perspective, yeah, a typically full-grown tree can absorb about uh, 21 kg of CO2 per year. So this 3,264 ton is equivalent to 155,000 uh, of trees uh, uh, planted uh, in a year to, to absorb this CO2. So it's definitely uh, not a small uh, sum, actually, this, this thing. So um, with that, I'm almost reaching the end of the presentation. Just allow me to go in with the uh, conclusion. So uh, ground improvement has been introduced to Asia since 1977. In fact, the first project in 1977 that done by Menard was the uh, Changi Airport uh, in uh, Singapore. And since then, the experience has come of age. Uh, it provides another option to engineers when solving the problem of uh, constructing uh, over soft ground. And uh, in addition to benefits of improving uh, of margin marginal ground for in development, uh, ground improvement is also a uh, sustainable construction methods. And uh, this uh, presentation has shown how ground improvement can be a green technology that can provide project owners with the opportunity to reduce energy consumption, lower CO2 emission and, and decrease in uh, material usage. Indeed, uh, ground improvement is a green technology that is economical uh, when it is well uh, adapted to the project requirements. Uh, lastly, I would like to highlight that uh, going green this day is no longer an option, you know, so I hope um, many of us, when we are dealing with our own projects, uh, regardless, what, regardless of whatever field, we will think about uh, Mother Nature, going green, try to uh, use as much as possible the green technology. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, I think it was uh, so comprehensive that we don't have so many questions, but we still uh, we still have two. Um, I don't know if you can uh, the Q and A. Um, yeah. Good, but uh, the chat actually I can see. I can questions see. in the chat, so feel free to to answer them. Okay, I think uh, one of the uh, thing that I, I showed just now the one hundred and fifty five. Uh, Thousand three. That that is the case here. Uh, one hundred fifty-five thousand three. Uh, as I said, uh, because one full-grown tree, it, it can absorb about twenty-one kg of CO two per year only. It's, it's it's really not that much as what we think the tree can do. So by uh, saving of this three thousand and two hundred and sixty-four tons, we can save one thousand and one hundred fifty-five thousand of tree that year from from uh, absorbing this uh, CO two. We can use to absorb. Uh, CO2 from other other projects or things like that. So yeah, um, 
course, uh, this is the, the CO2 absorbed by a tree in a year, 21 kg. Yeah. Okay, so it's another question is, is there any long-term effect of using uh, ground improvement compared to piling solution? So um, uh, I think uh, in the beginning of the presentation, I was uh, mentioning about uh, the project requirement. So definitely uh, we, we can uh, design the uh, ground improvement uh, to, to meet the project requirement in terms of settlements and in terms of uh, bearing capacity. Uh, if we are able to meet this type of requirement, basically it can perform uh, similarly to, uh, let's say, power solution. So, so in this example I gave, it's, it's not a power solution, but we do have projects that where we actually use ground improvement to replace paths and the projects are working uh, just well, you see. So th there is no um, uh, inferi inferiority by using this uh, ground improvement, uh, using uh, ground improvement method as uh, alternative to PALS. Uh, okay. I have one more question is how ground improvement will actually works again, uh, base uh, share of uh, earthquake load. So it, it have, uh, Okay, uh, the, the earthquake loading, uh, typically checking, we can use uh, ground improvement to, for instance, one of it is that using the earthquake drain that uh, I, I showed earlier, where you are using uh, this earthquake drain to be able to let the excess pore water pressure that uh, being formed during the earthquake to dissipate. So one of it is to use technology like this earthquake drain, but of course other methods, let's say like using stone column, for instance, we are able to do that also because uh, the stone column also act as a big drain system. And for loose sand, for example, which is susceptible to earthquake uh, methods like convection, dynamic convection or uh, viral convection uh, also work to uh, reduce the impact of uh, earthquake. To, to it. So, so yeah, it, it, it depends on uh, how thick the soil is, where, where is it located, and, and what kind of soil we are talking about. But uh, definitely ground, ground improvement can be uh, adapted to, to treat the, um, this uh, a quick uh, loading. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I, think I have uh, gone through all the Q and A actually. There's not mm, any more. Yeah. So, Okay, um, maybe um, to, to all, uh, all participants, we still have uh, roughly seven minutes. So if you have uh, any more questions regarding Richard's presentation, feel free to, to ask in the group chat. Um, if, we, we, if we don't have any more uh, questions uh, within the, the next two minutes, I uh, suggest that we close the session early, Richard, or maybe you have uh, anything else to, to share with us? Uh, okay, there is one one question that uh, is mentioned here. Do you observe client preference in uh, selecting a technology that is greener in, in Asia? I think uh, for, from what I see over the years, uh, definitely the awareness is increasing. Uh, they would like to use uh, green technology if, if possible, but uh, uh, being uh, in Asia, we all know price is always an uh, issue, sensitivity in terms of price, but definitely there's a growing trend uh, in uh, selecting a, a greener technology. And that's where uh, I guess uh, ground improvement uh, has been uh, getting uh, more and more receptive by a lot of uh, country uh, because uh, it used to be people will think about, okay, you have a foundation problem, you just go to do piles, you know, but uh, now I guess people are exploring uh, because they understand uh, apart from probably giving uh, the opportunity to, to, to go green, uh, actually a ground improvement solution uh, can be more cost effective than um, power solution actually, yeah. Uh, okay, there's another question that's mentioned that soil improvement allows to optimize the structural design of a building, concrete uh, quantity of steel, if yes, how? Okay, so um, th there is a potential for, for building. For instance, uh, we have been uh, 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 doing quite a lot where you have building like a warehouse or a big area load where 
uh, it used to be again with deep foundation where you need to have piles, you need to have pile cap, you need to have ground beam uh, to connect the slab and whatnot. So what we do is that we are using ground improvement. For instance, uh, if I can just quickly show what we do is uh, here, just, just, to, just to highlight that what, what we do is by we are putting in this type of inclusion, for instance, by putting in this inclusion in, what we do is we make a composite soil, which is um, uh, better property and your uh, building, for instance, these uh, warehouses can be sit directly onto this, um, onto this uh, ground treated with inclusion. And with that, actually you, you are uh, eliminating quite a lot of steel for let's say ground bin or power cap, uh, things like that. And your slab will be uh, slab on grid. So typically uh, that means uh, you will be able to save in terms of uh, amount of uh, steel uh, required and also concrete actually. So um, because if, if you are able to save, for example, the power cap, uh, which normally is quite thick, you know, so you, you are able to save some concrete. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think uh, any more questions? I think that's about all, uh, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's about it. Any uh, last words, uh, Richard? No, as I said, uh, ground woman, uh, not ground woman, green, green. Uh, Going green is, is no longer an option. So uh, I hope, yeah, when, when we, in our real life, uh, when we are handling project, we, we try to think about this uh, whenever possible. Okay? Try to go green as much as possible. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And thank you all uh, the, the participants. Uh, we're going to close the session in about uh, one or two minutes. So if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, Richard um directly um and um and let us know so um thank you th thank you all uh now is the start of the the b2b sessions so um go ahead back on the eventia platform and uh and uh, we all uh, wish you a very fruitful meeting thank you again uh, richard and thank you all thank you all thank you very much bye, -bye.